So good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure uh, to chair this session. Uh, welcome to all uh, uh, the here, the public we have uh, in presence. Welcome to our virtual public. And a warm thanks to our uh, uh, evaluation commission of this evening, to uh, uh, Professor, um, Professor uh, Charlotte Roberts, uh, and to Professor Paul Davis, UCL, respectively a referee and respondent for the uh, final thesis job of our former student here at, at Scuola Superiore, Luisa uh, Signorelli. Luisa is here with us, was, uh, a, a, has been an excellent student during her career here. We, I, I briefly present uh, to our guest professor and uh, will discuss a, a job uh, whose title is Female Virtue and Family Values in the 18th century's anthologization of Hamlet. So uh, I'm giving the floor uh, or the screen to Professor Roberts for um, a brief introduction. And then Luisa, you'll have 15, 20 minutes for your presentation. I, I, I know you have some uh, slides, PowerPoint. And then uh, Professor Paul Davis will uh, prosecute with discussion, with um, question and final conclusion. So please, Professor uh, Roberts. Hello, everybody. Uh, I hope that you can hear me OK. It's yeah. a really great pleasure for me to be here and to introduce Luisa Signorelli and her thesis, Female Virtue and Family Values in the 18th Century Anthologization of Hamlet. Uh, this is a thesis that addresses a topic which is situated across a number of scholarly fields. Uh, the study of Shakespeare's reception, the rise of the miscellany and the anthology in the 18th century, uh, the qualities and conditions of hack writing, and the feminization and domestication of 18th century culture. Uh, Louise's work uh, has great chronological scope, uh, beginning with the depiction of Shakespeare's women characters on stage in the adaptations of the Restoration period and going all the way through to uh, the work of Charles and Mary Lamb and Thomas and Henrietta Bowdler in the early 19th century. Her thesis shows a sensitivity to period in her examination of relevant intellectual and literary contexts. Um, so she considers the adaptations of the late 17th century in the context of Robert Filmer's Patriarcha, for example, and uh, examines the family Shakespeare's of the 19th century in relation to didactic works such as Mary Wollstonecraft's thoughts on the education of daughters. Uh, in doing this, Louisa argues for a development in attitudes towards Shakespeare's ethical value, to which the anthologies and rewritings that she examines uh, both contribute to and, and also respond to at the same time. The didactic and aesthetic value of Shakespeare's words, on which the family and instructional versions of the 19th century are founded, is shown by Louisa to be a product of the 18th century miscellany, as much as it is of the concurrent editorial tradition. So Louisa has conducted a thorough survey of the relevant critical scholarship in this thesis, but in the examination of her three most significant primary sources, uh, William Dodd's The Beauties of Shakespeare, Elizabeth Griffiths, The Morality of Shakespeare's Drama Illustrated, and Kresic's The Lady's Preceptor, she is often breaking new ground. The study of excerption presents challenges to the literary analyst, but Louisa meets these challenges by paying careful attention to the details of omission, alteration, presentation, and by examining paratextual and typographical elements in her texts, such as headings, notes, italicizations, etc. In these details, Louisa finds evidence of editorial intention, even if these intentions are often crudely didactic or market driven, interpreting these collections as creative acts of appropriation, to use her own a very telling phrase. 
In doing so, she makes a case for the interest in value of examining these often derivative and low value publications. By concentrating on the character of Ophelia and in particular the different versions of Polonius and Laertes' speeches of advice from Act I of Hamlet, Louisa is able to trace changing attitudes towards femininity across the 18th century. Filial obedience, sexual propriety and feminine distress remain perennial preoccupations, but they're explored differently at the beginning and end of this period, uh, as Louisa's thesis shows. Her primary examples, um, particularly those speeches from, from Act One, are particularly well chosen because, as Louisa notes, the speeches that rose to such prominence in the anthology were precisely those that were omitted or subject to cuts on the contemporary stage. What Louisa's thesis is able to trace, therefore, is a divergence in Hamlet's literary history, a moment when stage tradition and domestic consumption move apart only to come together again at a later stage, bringing with them the assumptions and attitudes of their respective genres. The thesis as a whole makes a great contribution to its chosen field, um, and it's uh, with great pleasure that I present it to you today and hand over to Louisa uh, for her to speak a little bit more about her work. Thank you. Thank you, Louisa. Professor Roberts, thank you very much. It's uh, your turn. OK, can, can you see the PowerPoint? Yes. yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, so um, I will tell you a little bit about my research, starting from the rationale that led me to studying Shakespeare's anthologization. Uh, that's because I think that uh, the anthology um, is very, it's strictly related to the way that we experience Shakespeare even today. So um, I would like to start with this quotation from Willow Boy. Uh, whereby it states that uh, it is indeed no great exaggeration to say that the concept of Shakespeare as it exists in the mind of the average man is a reflection of a long series of anthologies. A public opinion poll would probably show that the man in the street regards Shakespeare not primarily as a writer of plays, but as a sage, a purveyor of wise sayings, his masterpiece being Polonius's advice to Laertes. And of course, it is not a coincidence that this quotation mentions Polonius' advice to Laertes, since uh, it is, I believe, one of the most uh, frequently excerpted and decontextualized quotations or passages from Shakespeare. And here are some examples. Um, this is a picture that I took uh, last year at the George Orwell mm -hmm. lecture uh, in Conway Hall in London. And as mm -hmm. you can read, uh, um, to thine own self be true, uh, it's this inscription, which is, of course, a quotation from this dialogue. But you can also see tattoos and and even, of course, uh, social media posts. Uh, um, so yeah, the anthology uh, is strictly related to the way the, to the way we experience Shakespeare. Not only because it's a sort of experience Shakespeare by bits, but also because it constructs Shakespeare as a wise man. It uh, by the contextualizing uh, is uh, um, dramatic passages. It sorts of uh, uh, reconstructs them as expressions of his own thoughts. So Shakespeare uh, is embodied in sort of, in the, in the, it, it is sort of embodied in the wisdom of his quotations, even though they were actually um, words spoken by characters of, on stage. And um, this passage in particular is spoken by Polonius, who, who is arguably a parodic character because he doesn't actually um, practice what he preaches. And like, uh, even though these words are excerpted to, as a sort of uh, comment on universal behavior or how everybody should uh, behave. Uh, the passage itself is a little bit ironic, I think, since he just uh, um, presents his son with this list of precepts on how he should behave. And then he, he ends it by saying, but be yourself. So I, mean, I find it quite interesting. And uh, however, the practice of decontextualizing Shakespeare is not something new. Uh, it is actually quite 
contemporary. We can find in the in, the, in this first uh, Hamlet of Quarto, uh, Quarto sorry, in this first in the first Quarto of Hamlet, um, that uh, the same dialogue has been uh, highlighted. Um, these uh, inverted commas do not uh, signal um, dialogue. Uh, they are there as commonplace markers. So uh, they just signal to the reader that the passage was particularly important and then invited him or her to copy it in their own scrapbook, in their own book, these commonplaces books. Uh, later in the 17th and 18th century, uh, these manuscript books uh, were, um, became to be published as sort of collections or selected collections by uh, some editors. And this is, for example, uh, Edward Bish's uh, The Art of English Poetry. And they were organized uh, under headings, which were, of course, very broad categories so that they could fit uh, um, as many as authors and passages as they could, they possibly could. And under the heading friend, uh, again, we can see uh, an, a little excerpt from uh, um, Polonius' uh, advice to Laertes. And, uh, and of course, this is one step towards uh, decontextualizing Shakespeare, but it is also a way of sort of topicalizing um, his works, of grouping um, same topics under the same header. Uh, my thesis, however, as Charlotte has noted, is not really about Polonius' uh, ad advice to Laertes. I wanted to focus more on Ophelia and the kind of advice is uh, her um, her uh, brother and father give her. Uh, this is for uh, a lot of reasons. Uh, first, because I've noticed this prom the prominence of this passage in the anthologies of the time, of course. Uh, second, uh, because uh, I think that Ophelia uh, at the time played the uh, sort of uh, role of embodiment of Shakespeare's um, moral qualities. So here you can say some examples from uh, <laughs> two very different opinions, diverging opinions, one from Voltaire, who is notoriously um, a negative critic of Shakespeare, or at least he criticizes uh, a lot of aspects from Shakespeare's works. And he, he calls Ophelia Hamlet's mistress. Uh, on the other hand, there's Samuel Johnson, who uh, very notoriously referred to her as the harmless, the young, the beautiful and the pious. Um, and, and another reason is that I think that her virtue is very anthologizable, being restricted to only certain passages. Um, Ophelia is quite an ambiguous uh, character, her femininity is quite ambiguous. So uh, uh, being uh, only by anthologizing her virtue, you can just select uh, those isolated scenes where uh, her femininity is actually proper. Um, uh, sorry, um, I can't uh, change. I can't seem to. Uh, I can't seem to change. Uh, yeah. But, uh, I, sorry. Uh, okay, now it works. Okay, can you can I go back? Okay, okay, sorry. Um, so my first, uh, uh, the first uh, volume I analyzed uh, in my dissertation is uh, William Dodd's Beauties of Shakespeare. And of course, as you can see, uh, the editorial format has quite changed from the printed commonplace book. Here we have just some excerpts uh, taken from Shakespeare's works, uh, each one with his individual title. And uh, um, what I find quite interesting if, is um, the contrast between the anthologization of um, Laertes' advice to Ophelia and uh, um, the anthologization of Polonius' advice to his son. So uh, we can notice a sort of uh, decontextualizing um, scope in both uh, um, th these passages. However, the, the nature of this decontextualization is quite different. So uh, in the case of Laertes' advice to Ophelia, um, it is like uh, the recipient of his exhortation is um, generalized, is universalized, as if the passage was uh, referring to all womankind, so cautions to young ladies in general. Uh, in the case of Polonius's advice to Laertes, the advice is from a father to his son. So is, it is the familiar relation that uh, is being um, generalized. Um, another quite striking feature from these passages are the omissions. So in the case of the first of um, 
Laertes' advice to Ophelia. Uh, it is the um, political uh, duties of Hamlet that has been omitted. So, um, as you of course know um, here, uh, Laertes is telling Ophelia not to trust Hamlet. And in the Shakespeare test, uh, text, uh, he's telling her not to do so because he has some political duties and those political, political duties will always come first. Uh, uh, in this case, uh, here, um, by eliminating the reference to Hamlet's political duties, the natural of his advice, of course, is generalized, and uh, it seems like he is. Uh, um, he just wants her to be uh, to be uh, to, to be aware of uh, man's interest in general, of the interest of any uh, of any type of romantic pursuit. Um, in the case of uh, Polonius's advice to Laertes. The, uh, the omission is uh, once again um, is silent here, and it, it once again generalizes the content of the speech. Um, but uh, um, it's, it just uh, um, omit, the omission just uh, deletes uh, the original uh, cultural reference to France. So here, Polonius is telling Laertes how he should dress, and in, in the Shakespeare text, uh, this advice is related to the customs of France, to what is customary in France. Whereas here, uh, as well, it looks like it is universal advice. Uh, yeah, it doesn't work anymore. I think it's uh, because the, yeah. Yeah, if, I, if you just click on the slide, yeah. Okay, yeah, perfect, thank you. Uh, the, the second text uh, I analyzed is uh, Elizabeth Griffith's The Morative Shakespeare's Drama Illustrated, and it, this has been published some 20 years later. Uh, so if uh, Dodd, um, Dodd's editorial strategies seemed pointed at reaching a sort of decontextualization of the Shakespeare text. In the case of Elizabeth Griffith, uh, there is a sort of uh, con contextualizing effort, what I call an attempt at scholarly contextualization. So as we can see uh, here, there's um, the, the, the uh, the, the passage is prefaced by the short text describing its content, and uh, um, the part that she deems the most important uh, at the end is uh, has been Italia, um, has been written in italics. But it's like the uh, surrounding uh, context and codex has been preserved. Uh, moreover, um, in the paratext, uh, she points out uh, some instances when Shakespeare uh, used uh, some words uh, that can be deemed improper, such as boats, or uh, even uh, um, when he talks about uh, borrowers and lenders. Uh, uh, it is, uh, it is um, almost like as if she admitted that Shakespeare can be immoral in certain passages, but this immorality is cir circumscribed to only certain parts and does not uh, in any way make him less moral as a whole, if it makes sense. And um, there's also a sort of uh, um, underlying uh, dramatic theory that uh, drives uh, um, Elizabeth Griffith's choice of passages. Uh, in the case of Polonius' um, speeches, for example, uh, she thinks that the character is tragic. Uh, she, she, in, in this brief description of his exchange with uh, Rinaldo, uh, he talks about tenderness and parental respect. And even in another commentary, he says, she says that uh, his character has been mistaken, that he is he, actually um, a tragic character, which means, of course, that uh, every word he, he says must be taken with serious gravity. And this is also a reason behind their choices. Um, lastly, I've analyzed uh, The Lady's Preceptor, which is a different kind of text. Um, it's a, a publication that it, it is a speaker, that means this kind of publication that uh, um, were just a selection of text for students to read aloud and to master the art of reading aloud. But it is also a conduct manual since it is um, it, uh, uh, yes, it, 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 uh, it, it's uh, intended that audience is just a female audience. So the texts that were meant to be read aloud also had needed to have uh, um, moral content. Uh, we can see here how Shakespeare's morality is just taken for, taken for granted, basically, and uh, it can become a tool for feminine education. Uh, here, uh, Creswick just uh, omits the same passage that Dodd and even uh, Griffith did. But what I find more interesting, the most interesting, is uh, um, how he changes one phrase. So Shakespeare's chaste treasure open becomes uh, just chastity. 
and the effect is twofold. On, on the one hand, it erases the sexual illusion about treasure opening, and on the other hand, it explicitates the moral teaching to, um, to the reader. Um, another thing that I find quite uh, interesting is the way that uh, the editorial genre of uh, uh, Crazy Week's collection almost overrides the original context of the quotation. So, so uh, I, I made this little, <laughs> this, this little uh, image to explain it, but it's, it's basically as if the reader, by reading aloud, could uh, um, identify herself with Ophelia, creating a sort of superposed, uh, superposition between uh, uh, the reader and Ophelia, so the original addressee and uh, the implied addressee of the, of the physical uh, text, which I found quite interesting. Um, so, uh, as I said, uh, I, I found uh, um, like a lot of interest in the moral implication of these passages in the second half of the uh, 18th century, which uh, I think fades away with the Romantics. Uh, as we know, as everyone knows, like the Romantics uh, changed the, <laughs> the pers deeply changed the, the perspective on Shakespeare. Um, in the in the Lambs, uh, Tales from Shakespeare and the Baudelaire's Family Shakespeare, th those two publications are not anthologies per se, but I, I would say that the anthology is a clear antecedent of these kinds of publications. So the, um, the, the Lam uh, siblings uh, famously uh, re rewrote Shakespeare's plays. They remediated uh, their play, uh, his plays uh, in, um, in a prose form, basically. So we can see that there's a lack of interest in the moral implication on, of the passage. Uh, he just, uh, um, Charles Lam here, just uh, uh, rewrites it for the, uh, the its uh, um, narrative uh, um, role in, in the economy of the tragedy. Um, since um, uh, um, Charles Lamb um, uh, ret uh, retelling of Hamlet is just based on the dramatic, on the tragic relationship between Hamlet and Ophelia. Uh, what is interesting is that uh, ha ha although he changes uh, a lot of the Shakespeare test, he also retains uh, a lot of words as well, uh, even those who have clear sexual uh, implications or connotations. And lastly, in the Baudelaire, the passage is uh, once again uh, ignored. It, it is left unchanged. But the Baudelaire's uh, do also um, on, act on Shakespeare at the world level, we could say. And I just wanted to present you with this example, which I find quite telling. And it is a part of Polonius's um, speech to Renaldo, dialogue with Renaldo. And it's just uh, um, listing a series of crime that uh, he wants uh, his son to be rumored <laughs> to have committed. And uh, we can see in this list of the original list was drinking, fencing, swearing, quarreling and ended with drubbing, which means having sexual relations with um, prostitutes. And uh, they just uh, erased them. So it was just drinking, fencing, swearing, uh, quarreling. And then Ronaldo replies, my lord, that would dishonor him. <laughs> of course, now these crimes, uh, these scenes, uh, are made to appear much more, <laughs> uh, much more, uh, uh, yeah, that they the original were, um, and yeah. So just some conclusions. Uh, uh, one is uh, about uh, where Shakespeare um, morality actually lies, and uh, uh, according to Marsden's re the reimagined text, although she focuses on theater adaptations, um, there's this sort of shift in Shakespeare criticism from uh, the, to the, the notion that Shakespeare's morality lay in his fable, and then it disevolved uh, as it lay li lying in, it, in his words. And I think this is true for the anthology as well. We can see it in Dodd's uh, attempts at the uh, contextualization of the fable of the events that are happening, and then in this uh, attention on words. Uh, even though um, the Lambs and the Bowders have completely different approach to the Shakespeare test, the text, they both, they both think and thought that uh, his morality lay at world level, basically. One, one's expressed it by preserving his words and the others by erasing just those, those words who, which made it, his text immoral, but never working at subtext level, for example. And, uh, and lastly, uh, the way that uh, uh, the editorial tradition approached the Shakespeare. So from the emergence of selections of beauties that uh, um, really were part of the beauties and false criticism of this sort of evaluative criticism that was devoted to finding the best pieces of the author, but also his worst. Um, 
from this election of beauties, both um, at the same time, uh, Shakespeare criticism and editorial criticism in general changed. And uh, by the end of the century, Shakespeare was considered to be an inherently moral uh, author whose passages could be used for educational purposes, for example. And, and that's it. Thank you. Thank you for your attention. Thank you.